Right, this is revision for the first physics exam. Um, I'm going to go through loads and loads of stuff, so it's all of the year 10 content. When you're watching this video, don't just watch the video, try and get involved. So when I tell you to pause the video, pause it, try the questions, write your answers down on a bit of paper, then continue with the video and review your answers. See if you are right or wrong. That's going to be much more effective than just listening to me ramble on. So try and get involved, get your brain active, and it'll be much more uh, efficient and it'll have much more of an impact uh, and improve you before the first physics exam. Right, first thing we need to understand is the difference between scalar and vector quantities. So we can measure loads of different things in physics. So you could measure the temperature of an object, you could measure the speed of something, you could measure um, the mass of something or the weight of something. So all of these things can be basically put into two different categories. So things that have just got amounts, which we can call magnitudes, things that have just got numbers, so like temperature, you could have 10 degrees or 60 degrees C, that would be a scalar quantity. But in physics, so later on in the course, when we look at stuff like um, collisions, um, when we look at the difference between mass and weight, for example, basically some things were also interested in the direction. So anything that has um, a size and a direction, like forces, we know that forces like you could have five newtons to the right or 15 newtons up or weight pulling down of 800 newtons or something. So that it would be a vector quantity. So scalar quantities have sizes, whereas vector quantities have sizes and directions. Right, the next thing is, um, so distance time graphs. So this um, also comes up in maths GCSE. So pause the video now and can you calculate the speed at A, B, C and D? Right, so if you've had a go at them, great, ask yourself this. If not, I might give you like little hints. So for example, you need to know that speed equals distance over time to answer this question. So now I've given you a little hint. You might want to now, because you couldn't access it before, can you now pause the video and work out the speed at A, B, C and D? So throughout the video, don't just pause the video when I tell you. You might just want to have a think or write some notes. So... To calculate the speed at part A, well, the distance it's travelled is 30 kilometres, and that has took, so 30 kilometres, and that's took between 9 and 11, that's 2 hours. So its speed there would be 15 kilometres per hour. At B, it started at the distance of 30, and it's still there, so its distance is zero, and it doesn't matter how long, if, if you do zero divided by anything, but it's zero divided by one, so it will be zero kilometers an hour at B. C, it has, it started at 30, and it went up to 60, so it's traveled 30 kilometers in half an hour, so 0 0.5 hours. So at part C, its speed was 60 kilometers per hour. And then D, D will be 40 kilometers per hour. Right, this looks really similar, but this is a velocity time graph. Um, so again, can you pause the video and answer them questions? What hap what's happening at part B and so on? Right, part B, so at the start, so use the information from the graph. So the velocity is 30, and at the end, the velocity is still 30. So what's happening at part B? Well, it's traveling at a constant velocity of 30 meters per second. What's happening, uh, calculate the acceleration during A. So what we need to realize here is acceleration is a change in speed, the end speed take away the start speed, divided by the time it took. So in part A, its speed's changed, so the end speed is 30, and it was originally going zero, so the change in speed's 30, divided by, it took two seconds, so it is 15 meters per second squared. So what acceleration is it it's a rate that the speed changes at how much does the speed change every second so what we figured out there is each second it speeds up by 15 meters per second each second so basically after zero seconds it was going zero 
after one second it would have been going 15 and after two seconds it would have sped up by another 15 it will be now be going 15 at 15 30 meters per second so the acceleration there was 15 uh, and calculate the distance traveled so you need to be able to look at one of these graphs and realize that the distance traveled is the area under the graph so if we split that up into different shapes we've got a triangle there and a square or a rectangle there so can you now pause the video if you haven't already and work out the area under the graph so the size of the shapes there we've got three on the bottom 30 on the side uh, and 20 on this triangle bit so to work out the distance um, during this square bit it will be th uh, 3 times 30 which will be 90 meters and then this bit you would work out the area of this rectangle and then divide it by 2 to work out the area of the triangle so it would be 20 times 3 divided by 2 so 30 divided by 2 uh, 60 divided by 2 would be uh, 30 so add that to the 90 the distance travel would be 120 meters right so we're just going to do a little overview and compare distance time graphs to velocity time graphs so a horizontal line on a distance time graph means that it's stationary but on a velocity time graph that would mean it's going at a constant velocity the only time you uh, you could have a, um, a stationary object on a velocity time graph is if um, the velocity was like constantly zero so uh, a steeper line on a distance time graph means that an area uh, uh, objects going fast on a velocity time graph it means it would have a like a big um, acceleration and comparing that to a shallow line on a distance time graph that means an object would be traveling slower and a velocity time graph would have like a, a smaller acceleration right next thing is like kind of two ways to um discover the speed of something so one thing we can do is just simply speed equals distance divided by time and what this what we're actually calculating here is the average speed so if a car went down a ramp it would speed up wouldn't it but if we know it's travelled one metre uh, and say we time it and that took um, two seconds, then what we'll, we could work its speed out, it would be one metre divided by two seconds, so it would be going 0 0.5, 0 0.5 metres per second. But that would be its average speed. There's another thing we can do which kind of takes an um, instantaneous speed, so a speed at different points. And this would be to use a light gate. So if you know the distance of a piece of cord, a light gate will work out speed. And how it does that is that if you input the width of cord uh, into the light gate or into a data logger, so these wires will be going to a computer called the data logger. If you tell it the width of the cord, the cord interrupts. The, there's a little light that beams across here. So if it's interrupted for a long time, then it can work out the speed and it'll be, no, if it's interrupted for a long time, it's going to be going slowly. If it's interrupted for a really short amount of time, the cord moves through there really, really fast. It's going to know that it's going faster. And how it does that is it basically times how long it's interrupted for. Um, and if you know the width of the cord and how long it's interrupted for, the light gate works out speed. So this is good for working out like the speed at different points so it can work out the speed at the top of the ramp and then at the bottom of the ramp and what basically what it can do is it can use that and so that's the starting speed and that's the end speed and if you can work out two speeds then you can work out acceleration so e equals v minus u over t for example so two ways we're going to look at speed well we can just measure a distance traveled in time so if you wanted to work out the speed of a car you might kind of put two marks on a road measure between the marks and then as a car's going past you can start a stopwatch when it gets to the first mark stop the stopwatch when it gets to the second mark and then do speed speed equals distance over time conversely you could basically um, have a light gate on a road and if you know the length of the car 
how long the car interrupts that light gate for, you could work out the speed of a car. Right, energy stores and transfers. So there's lots and lots of different types of energy transfers. We're going to have a look at different ones in a second. But um, one that quite often comes up in tests and a really good one to kind of understand that energy doesn't just isn't just one thing it can kind of um go between different stores is the energy stores in a bouncy ball so what type of energy does a bouncy ball have before it's dropped well it's got lots of gravitational potential energy because it's high up but it's not moving when you drop it that gravitational potential energy all turns into kinetic energy so it gets faster and faster and faster it's as fast as it's going to get just before it hits the floor and then what happens is that kinetic energy is transferred back into gravitational potential energy. It then stops at the top, so it's got no kinetic energy. It almost stops. And then as it starts moving the other way, it turns back into kinetic energy. The reason why it never gets as high uh, as it did in the first place is some of that energy gets lost or transferred to a, um, a different store. So what would happen there is it would turn into a thermal store. So the bouncy ball itself, because it's stretching, would heat up a tiny bit. It would also heat the air up because it's pushing the air particles out of the way and air resistance. Some of that energy would turn into thermal energy. If it was 100% efficient, this system, the bouncy ball would just carry on bouncing forever. It would go to exactly the same height it was dropped at. That doesn't happen because it's not 100% efficient. Can you just pause the video now and have a think about what energy do, the, do these things, so these are different kind of uh, machines, what energy is inputted and what does it turn into? Uh, I'm then going to go through them, so if you pause the video now and give yourself a couple of minutes um, to have a think about these. Right, a solar panel um, converts light energy into electricity. Um, a bow would convert elastic, so the, the bow itself would stretch and so would the, the string, in the kinetic energy of the arrow. A television would transfer electrical energy into light and sound, and also heat, but heat would be um, a wasted energy store. A car would convert chemical from the petrol into kinetic as it moves. An explosion would be a chemical energy into kinetic, it would move and sound, it would make a big bang, and a little bit of light, you can see the, the flames there, so it must be giving off a little bit of light as well. A microphone would convert um, sound energy into electricity. The rocket would convert the chemical energy of the fuel into gravitational potential energy as it gets higher up, but between that, it would, it would move, so it would turn into kinetic energy first, so the rocket would move and get high up, and then a pole vaulter, there's different ways of thinking about this, but it would convert, I guess, chemical energy. So we use chemical energy, we eat food. In the kinetic energy, the pole vaulter would move, and as she gets higher up there, she would turn that kinetic energy into gravitational potential energy. Right, so efficiency, so these are different types of light bulbs. So these are like the, the old style light bulbs that get really, really hot. These are more energy efficient lamps, LEDs. So basically efficiency is kind of the proportion of the energy that you put in that becomes useful. So what do you want a light to do? You want it to light up. So to work out efficiency, you would do the useful energy divided by the, the total energy in. So the, the maths here would be um, 0 0.8 divided by 40 um, and then you can times that by 100 if you want to have efficiency in, as a percentage you don't have to though you, it can be between like zero being not efficient at all no useful energy has came out of it to an efficiency of 1.0 which is like all of the energy that you put in it goes into the store that you want and um, so if I do work out the efficiency of the old style lamps, that would be 2% um, efficient. But the new one, see if you can work it out. Um, it would be 0 0.8 divided by 4. 
So it's creating the same amount of light energy, but you need less energy in, so it's going to be more efficient. So it would have an efficiency of 0 0.2 um, or 20%. So 10 times more efficient. Um, right, next thing is the electromagnetic spectrum. So you do need to know uses for all the different bits. So I'm sure you can pause this video now and like write them down or cover them up and see if you can remember the different uses. Uh, one thing I want to point out is the visible light spectrum. So it's Roy G. Biv, but on this um, thing it's backwards. So light's made up of um, seven colours of the rainbow um, and there's a red side and a violet side. And obviously the violet side is closer to the UV. So ultraviolet means beyond the violet part of the ra rainbow. So can we see it? No, we can't see ultraviolet. We can see visible violet light, but we can't see ultraviolet because it's got too high a frequency for us to see. Um, and then UV, ultraviolet, we can't see that with our eyes. Uh, sorry, infrared. We can't see infrared uh, with our eyes, but we can de detect it with our skin as heat. So we can't see infrared because it's um, too low a frequency. It's got too long a wavelength to um, basically excite the pigments in our eyes, so we can't see it. Um, and then, so if we understand that, so the red part of light has the longest wavelength or the lowest frequency and the violet wa wavelength of light has the highest frequency or the shortest wavelength. Right, um, next thing is refraction that I want to go over. So this always comes up. Uh, you would be expected to kind of complete one of these diagrams. So when light slows down, so one thing to mention is that when light goes into things like glass, or if light goes into plastic or water, it's going to slow down compared to things like air. So light travels faster in a vacuum. It slows down a little bit when it goes into gases like air, and it slows down much more when it goes into more dense materials like glass or water. So what would happen is, when it slows down, it would bend towards the normal. And what I mean by that is, so the angle that it comes in at is bigger than the angle that it um, refracts after it refracts. So refraction happens as soon as it crosses the boundary. So a few people, when they've done questions on this in the past, like what happens, they've thought like, oh, it does this, and then it bends somewhere in, inside. It doesn't. It bends as soon as it hits that boundary, changes direction, and then what would happen at the end is it would speed back up. So it would change direction and it would be parallel uh, to the direction it goes in. So light does that because it slows down. Um, so yeah, refraction, make sure you understand the direction it moves it. Right, next thing is radioactivity. So for the standard paper, you need to understand uh, the difference between alpha, beta and gamma radiation. So they're the symbols. You need to know what they're made out of. So um, alpha radiation is like a helium nucleus. It's, got, it's made out of two protons and two neutrons. It's big. It's two plus because it's got two protons in it. So because of that, it's re really, really good at stealing electrons from that. So it's very, very ionizing. So ionizing means it can turn other things into it ions it can make things charged so because of that it doesn't go through things very easy what happens is it basically pinches electrons from stuff um, and basically just becomes a helium atom and it would just float off so it gets stopped by paper the next thing is um beta radiation which is basically just a very very high energy electron it moves very very fast um, and these will get through paper but it would be stopped completely by three millimeters of aluminium. If you had like one millimeter of aluminium, that would stop like 75% of it probably. But 
it's going to get stopped by three millimeters of uh, aluminium and then the last thing gamma ray which is just electromagnetic radiation so it's just energy it's made out of exactly the same stuff that light's made out of which is just electromagnetism it's not a particle that will go through aluminium really easily but it'll be stopped by lead so if you had a radioactive like rock or something which was given off radioactivity and you wanted to know which type of radioactivity um it was what you could do is you could measure you could measure the activity um with nothing so we're going to look at how to measure that but you'll get a thing called a gm tube and see that there's like a thousand counts per minute so 1,000 counts per minute. You would then put a bit of paper in the way and see if that changes. So you put a bit of paper in the way, it's still a 1,000 counts per minute. Is it alpha radiation? No, it's definitely not because th this radiation is getting through the paper. What would you do next? You might put three millimeters of aluminium in the way. Does the count change? Yeah, it does a bit. Goes down to 500. So do you think there's any beta particles in that well yeah there must be because it's getting stopped a bit by the aluminium so you could probably say yeah there is beta alum uh, radiation in this rock because it's getting stopped by aluminium but there's probably also gamma how could you prove that well you could put some really thick lead in the way and does it get stopped now yes it does it goes down to like maybe 20 why is there still 20? Well, that's because of the background radiation. That's not even coming from this rock. It's coming from, like, maybe the other side of the thing. So that would be an example of how you could see which type of radioactivity um, is in a sample. Right. A few questions to have a think about now. So get your brain actively involved in this. Pause the video now and see. Can you answer them? Can you find the answers on Google? Can you go on BBC Bite Size? Um, if you type in BBC Bite Size, Ed Excel, radioactivity, the answers will be in there. Right, answers. So three sources of background radiation. You could have things like um, radon gas is a good one. So it's, it's what one of the most common in the UK. So building materials, so all kind of bricks and stuff have got really trace amounts of uh, uranium in and that's radioactive, so anything that's made out of rock, so all of the kind of concrete uh, and bricks and stuff that the school building's made out of, for example, that would be very, very slightly radioactive, trace amounts, and that's what background radiation is. It's the radioactivity that's always around us. Medical, so if you have radiotherapy or x-rays, that is radioactive. Um, would that be the same amount for everyone? No. So people that have more treatment would have a lot more of that type of radiation. And then cosmic, um, so that's radioactivity from space. Pilots get more of that. Astronauts get even more of that because their um, radiation stopped by the atmosphere. So they don't have that protection if they're higher up in the atmosphere. And then there's things like food. So bananas are very slightly radioactive. Right, next question. How can you measure radioactivity? So you would use a GM tube. That's what this thing is here. Um, it is. It stands for a Geiger-Muller tube. What happens is the radioactivity goes into a small window there, and it basically would either click, or you can attach it to a counter, or you can, yeah, attach it to a speaker, which, um, like, clicks or beeps when radioactivity enters that tube. And you can like figure out how many counts per minute is given off by a sample. Right, so imagine we've got two different rocks here and we'll want to count. We we'll want to figure out how radioactive they are. What could we do? There's loads of steps that we'd have to take here. So have a think about this. I reckon there's four kind of steps that would need to have a go at. So again, pause the video. How many of them steps do you think you could get? Imagine in an exam now how many of them kind of points would you get? Right, the first thing you would do is measure the background radiation. So that would be like, you don't even have the rocks in the same room as the Geiger Muller tube, and you just measure how radioactive is that particular room. So you might want to count for like one minute. 
Next thing you do is get the, the first rock in and you will put it next to the Geiger Muller tube and count for another minute. So you get the first rock in, you count for one minute. How radioactive is that? You're then going to take the first rock out of the room, get the second rock in the room, and again, you're going to count for one minute. Is that us done? No, what we need to do is, so say we, we counted the background radiation, there was like 28 counts in a minute. And the first rock, we'll say that had like a radioactivity of 538. And the second rock, well, that was like much more radioactive. It was 10,120. What we'd have to do next is we'd have to take away the background radiation to figure out, well, what is the radioactivity actually coming from the rock? Because on average, 28 counts of background radiation were in that room even without the rocks. So we're going to take them numbers off and we can work out the kind of radioactivity from them rocks. So that would be how you measure the radioactivity of two different rocks. Right, and next thing that always comes up in exams is half-life. So half-life, so everyone was really good at this when, when we did it um, during lessons. So half-life is the time it takes for the activity to half. So if you had like something that's radioactive, would it always be radioactive? Well, no, because what the reason why it's radioactive is because it's kind of breaking down, it's decaying. So if you came back after so long, well, it would be like half as radioactive. And be, that's what half-life is. It's the time it takes for it to become half as radioactive. So what people often say is like, it's the start the other way. They're like, what's half-life? It's like when something's half as radioactive, but it's not, it's a, it's a measurement of time. So it's a time it takes for something to get half as radioactive. Right, the activity at the start of these samples is both 120. So they both start at 120. So can you work out how radio, like the half-life of these two different things, so source, source A and source B? So pause the video, have a, have a go. Right, so source A is 120 at the start. Half of that is 60. So at, how long does it take for its activity to go from 120 to 60? How long does it take for its activity to half? Well, it takes five seconds. So it's activity here is 60. I'll show you how to do it. another one. So it's activity here is 60. How long does it take for its activity to go from 60 to 30? So there its activity is halved. Here it takes another five seconds. So the half-life of source A is five seconds. I've shown you that now. Can you have a go at source B if you haven't already done this? So the activity, again, of source B was 120. It goes down to 160, but this one takes 20 seconds for that to happen. So that's how it work out half-life. You half the activity and figure out how long it took. Right, next thing. thing everyone's rubbish at waves, and I don't know why. It, I think they're all right. Right, so what we need to know is probably two examples. It's hard to think of two examples for longitudinal, so one example is good enough for that one. Um, two examples are transverse, though. How they move, so you need to say very specific things about these. Um, and, well, which one's sound and which one's light? Is, is light longitudinal or transverse? How they move, that's a, a mega important one. So we're going to have a look at them. So transverse wave will be caused if if you move the slinky up and down, so it's fixed at one end and you move it up and down. So each particle, so each rung of the slinky would only move up and down. The energy is going this way, so the energy would move from your hand to the fixed point. So the energy would move that way, but the particles would move up and down. So the particles are moving at right angles to the direction of energy. So when it says, how does a particle move? Basically what that's saying, like compared to the direction, compared to the direction of the energy. So long, 
longitudinal are in the same direction as the energy, whereas transverse are kind of at right angles. So that's what you need to see. Right, longitudinal, as I said, so that would be if you pushed the slinky backwards and forwards. And what would happen to each rung, it would move that way for a bit, and then it would start moving back that way. So the longitudinal waves go in the same direction that energy is transferred. So this is a the completed table. Um, so questions that always come up on this might be like compare longitudinal with transverse. And if a compare question comes up, you can see similarities as well as differences. So the similarity is that they both transfer energy energy is transferred the difference is while a longitudinal wave goes in the same direction that energy is transferred but a transverse wave goes at right angles to the way that energy is transferred um, other differences so like light can travel through a vacuum sound can't you can't speak in space you can't hear the sun because the space between us so sound cannot travel in space no matter how loud it is and um, because basically in sound, particles need to bump into each other. And if there's no particles, then that can't happen. Right, two, we did, we did this during lessons um, in a lot of detail. So I just want to quickly go over this. Imagine you're here, you're watching this happen. These waves are moving that way. How could you work out the speed that them waves are traveling at? Well, what you could do is you could do speed equals distance over time. And what you would do is, you would measure between these two ladders, you would start timing, you would start the stopwatch when it gets to the first ladder, and you would stop the stopwatch when it, the wave gets to the second ladder. So you've got the time there, and you would do the distance divided by that time, so that would be one method. The second thing you could do is, you could work out the wavelength of one wave. So what this says is the wave speed equals the frequency times the wavelength so the, the wavelength of one wave we could actually work out with this picture so there's one wave there two three four five so five wavelengths fit between them ladders so each wave therefore must be two meters because the five waves measure 10 meters so one wave must measure two meter, two meters to work out the frequency, you would basically count how many waves go past in one second. How many waves go past the ladder in one second. So a frequency is how many things happen in a second. And what you do is you do the frequency times the wavelength, and that would also give you the speed. So good luck. If, if you've got a mock exam coming up, I wish you the best of luck. Um, what I will say is, email me or find us on teams and send us a message if there's anything that you want me to go over or go through in detail this isn't this should not be the only revision you're doing and um, have a look i'm sure there was some things i said there which you were like oh i've completely forgot about that topic so go away go on bbc bite size the science exam board is at excel and if you're in um, 11A2 or 11A3, you'll be doing combined physics. So Google BBC Bite Size Edexcel Combined Physics and you'll get the right page. If you're doing triple science, I'm going to go over some um, triple specific stuff in a, in a separate video. So you'll also have to watch that. But best of luck, everybody. Well done.